when you look at uh, so when you're looking at the uh, at where we are with the fee today, uh, it, it seems like we the service maybe had this idea of distributed value, right? Okay, we're going to take the ships we've got, we're going to uh, you know load them up with weapons, put them into the anti-axis zone, and cause havoc. Um, but that idea has since kind of been uh, dialed back and continues to kind of be rolled back and rolled into well distributed, but yeah, still attached to the carrier. Um, and I'm wondering how if you see any parallels between the you know the, the situation you described of evolving fleet architectures and this sort of institutional resistance to anything new <laughs> inside the Navy. Um, so that yeah, there's there. Uh, first of all, I'm I'm a skeptic on uh, on distributed lethality. Oh, um, so the the one thing about it though is in the Honorverse, uh, there is there is the wall of battle and there's you know cruiser divisions and and super dreadnought divisions and and that's how it's going to operate. But there's also independent cruisers, which I, I firmly believe that we actually need more what I call frigates in the Navy today to do the load in, day to day, go out, demonstrate, show the flag, do the fawn ops, convoy escort, that type of stuff. Um, we don't have enough of that. In fact, we have no frigates in the fleet today. I, I don't count LCS as a frigate. Uh, the distributed lethality, though, was, a, was an interesting intellectual exercise to attempt to figure out how to fight a war or, or with a, a fleet that was only 271 ships at the time that that was coming out. And of course, what it was, what we didn't want to admit was rather than have the, all the capital vessels in order to project power against the enemy capital, uh, we were going to accept a long war and fight a perimeter war slowly compressing the enemy inward. So we had gone from all the lessons learned that we had from World War II about trying to get within reach of Japan to hit the capital to saying, okay, I'm willing to step back strategically and be in the same place I was at the beginning of the war and just do slow compression. So in, in a way, I thought it was intellectually, um, uh, it sought to ignore the history that, that we had built up to come up with the, the fleet structure that we had today. I'm, I'm gonna offer a counterpoint. Go ahead. Like my, I don't, I don't, okay, I'm gonna offer a counterpoint. I don't, I don't, I don't think that uh, the distributed lethality is as dead as you might have implied. And I'll give an example. Uh, and it's a good one because Carter Rock was deeply involved. But <laughs> right, distributed lethality is about using your platforms in new ways, and I think it's very much in the in the Honor Harrington. I'll uh, you know, Honor Harrington in and I'll couple spoilers here, but this would have been short victorious war. She's in command of the battle cruiser. She's worried that her battle cruisers might end up having to face something heavier. So she comes up with the pods and the tow, and it's like, well. For a little while, we can turn the battle cruiser into a dreadnought, and then all hell's gonna break loose, but maybe by the time all hell breaks loose, we'll get reinforcements, something good will happen. Uh, so this summer, right on an LPD-17, a ship that was originally designed and built to haul Marines around, we put HIMARS on it, and we were able to shoot, land attack, and potentially, eventually, that weapon could be reasonably modified, surface-to-surface -surface missiles off of an LPD. And we did it because we're able to do that because of the science that NAVC and specifically Carterock brings to the task. Because what's the problem with putting up one of the problems with putting a high Mars on the flight deck of an LPD is you run the risk of setting your flight deck on fire. Right. <laughs> right. Which wh where's my submariner? What's the adjective? Bad, right? <laughs> Very but good. when you have science in service of the warfighter, you can solve those material problems and you can make it safe to launch the high Mars off the flight deck, which we showed this week. And we, we invested a lot of, of our intellectual effort and time at Carter Rock to making sure that that was going to be a safe launch because of our support of distributed lethality. So I realize it's not as, as <laughs> prevalent in the messaging as when Admiral Roden may have first come out with it, but, but I think it's still very much alive. And I think the theme of uh, well, regardless of what you call it, and one of the things you can learn from great fiction like the Honor Harrington series is taking the science you have and using it to figure out new ways that that science serves the warfighter is a great theme in science fiction, but it's also a, a imperative for the Navy today. So sorry to no, jump your, no, sorry no, to no, jump no, your, uh, no, your, your genre there, but the, uh, yeah. Gentlemen, to, in talking about sci-fi, the nature of
trying to find lessons. For those of us who may be over eager to find lessons in things that aren't real, what do you think are some of the fictional or even real life, like real program, narrative myths that are dangerous for people who want to innovate or develop tactics? Uh, what, are, what are some of the pitfalls that you see in both fiction and even in the stories that we make about our own program's successes or failures? You want, you, want, I'll t you want me to go first? Yeah, you go. Okay, so uh, before I talk, oh, microphone. So before I talk about pitfalls, uh, there's a book, and this is maybe 20 years ago, I might be dating myself. Uh, everything I needed to learn in business, I, everything I needed to know in business, I learned in kindergarten. So everything I ever needed to know about acquisition, I learned from Wayne E. Meyer. Right, that's, uh, and so, and nothing that he taught me or that the people that he taught who taught me, because I'm a, a generation, I was, I was honored to be able to know Admiral Meyer before he passed away and to spend a lot of time in deep conversation with him. But truly the people that he trained were the people who turned around and trained me. It's all still true, right? Because it's based on certain truths about people and it's based on truths about war and it's based on truths about um, science. So things, that's why, and I, you know, one of the articles I wrote recently about why engineers should read the classics. They should read the Bible and they should read Homer and they should read Plato and Aristotle because those things are true and they've stood the test of time. Now we're talking about science fiction today which is wonderful and I love and great science fiction has that same point but I would without mentioning anything specifically since I'm up here wearing a uniform um, and my ISIC is probably watching this. I'm not going to mention any specific programs but I find myself resonating. I, I don't want to be totally in the Alexander camp there of, of poo-pooing the new school. The new school is great when it's based on sound science and sound understanding of what your strategic principles are. Anyone who's willing to offer you a easy solution to a hard problem, it's like, yep, no, we've got, you know, and, and you know, what, what went in the early 2000s, we've got a transformational solution here. <laughs> Right. A transformational solution will not keep your destroyer from rusting. A good paint scheme will keep your destroyer from <laughs> rusting. And you need to reapply it on a regular basis because the science says so. Um, so anyone who offers you the, I've got a magic fix, run and hide. Right? War is hard. Keeping a navy is hard. One of the things I love about, and you can explore this more, you can't do this in a movie. right? If you had star, I mean, There are Star Wars books, but if you, had, you can't do this in a movie. Is you get the feeling in, in the in the in the Weber books that it comes across. It's hard to maintain a navy. It's hard to build a navy. You've got to have thousands and thousands of people working really hard in concert, finely coordinated, just to get something that complicated out either at sea or at ship. So if someone says, "I have a quick, easy solution," run and hide. It's hard work. And the people who embrace the hard work and say, "This is how we've done hard things in the past," even if we have a different hard thing to do. The discipline of systems engineering, the discipline of being clear-eyed about what your things really are going to cost, what they're really going to take to have. People who are clear-eyed about that, that's who you want to go and embrace. Wayne e. Meyer, the late Rear Admiral who was the father of the Aegis program, in my mind did that as well or better as anyone who ever served the United States Navy, and I still look to him as a, as a source of inspiration even to this day. So I'll, I'll say one of the one of the myths, uh, and this is this is sort of counterintuitive, one of the myths that goes around right now is that there's no such thing as revolutions, there's only evolutions. And I, I think that that is a myth. Uh, the fact of the matter is sometimes you gotta break stuff. Um, and you know, we had uh, from 1922 to 1939, we had a number of fleet exercises. We knew what was gonna work and what wouldn't work and we resisted it at every way, you know, every step along the way until the Japanese broke stuff for us and suddenly those three carriers at sea were the only thing that stood between us. And so it actually took an outside force to revolutionize the Navy, despite the fact that all the lessons were there. You know, when, when Nimitz told Spruance uh, to go to Point Luck, you know, it, it, was like, it was like Peyton Manning calling Omaha at the line. It was an audible and Spruance immediately knew the play that was called and he proceeded as did Frank Jack Fletcher. They went there, they set themselves up. They had already practiced that play at the War College and in fleet exercise time and time again, but the battleship admirals were not going to allow that to happen. So as we look at the evolution, evolution school today that says we need to evolve smoothly and do all these things step by step, the fact of the matter is, is every now and then it's gonna take a revolution to be able to really change things. 
And I will just add to that that in four years at the University of Tennessee, Peyton Manning never beat the University of Florida. <laughs> yeah, Tim Tebow's Super Bowl rings are doing pretty good. <laughs> Question. All right. I, th I think there's a reason why no one wants to ask questions is because there's actually someone else that someone wants to hear from. So I know I do too. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Thanks, Thanks,